Hi everybody, I'm Sam Mewis and welcome to the Women's Game. Today we're going to hear from Jill Scott, former Lioness, 2022 Euros champion, and she's just a longtime favorite of everybody in England. All the fans love her. Jill's done so much for the game, including since her retirement. She's become a football pundit. She's competed on a reality TV show. Just wait one second. You're going to hear all about this, I promise. But before we get to Jill, here are some updates from the game. Big news out of Bay FC, Zambian international Rachel Kundanji officially signed with NWSL club Bay FC. It's another world record transfer fee. So it's around $787,000, but then there's like $75,000 of performance bonuses. The amounts are like a whole thing, but basically she's the most expensive female soccer player in the world. Rachel's a dynamic striker. We can't wait to see her attacking prowess be added to this already star-studded forward line at Bay FC. And this transfer fee was actually just recently broken by Myra Ramirez at Chelsea. So I feel like this news and the fact that it kind of keeps happening is indicative of the game's growth financially all over the world. It's super exciting. I watched the Chelsea Man City game from Friday, and I was really excited to see Man City get the win. It was a one to nothing victory, and now Chelsea and Man City are tied for first on points in the WSL. Such a great goal from Jamaican striker Bunny Shaw. It was assisted by Jess Park, who is really growing into being like a really important player in the Man City midfield. When I played at Man City, Jess was actually playing more as a winger, but I love her in the midfield. I think that she has such a great foundation of skills and she's a young player. So she's so much room to grow, but her impact has been really noticeable the past few weeks. She stole the ball off a defender, dribbled forward and slotted the ball to Bunny Shaw. And I keep seeing her taking space through the midfield like that. So I think the next element for Jess Park is to shoot sometimes. I think that will open up more passes for her if she starts shooting from the top of the box. But we'll see more. I'm like really excited to keep watching her and I'm really excited for Man City that they've put themselves in such a great situation. I also watched the Arsenal Man U game on Saturday and Arsenal won decisively. They won three to one despite the game feeling closer than that. Sometimes I think Arsenal looked a little bit nervous around the back at the beginning, but the highlight here of this game was that the game was played at Emirates stadium where the Arsenal men's team usually plays, but this is the very first time that the women sold out Emirates stadium for a WSL fixture. And I loved seeing the crowd full. It looked electric and we shared this clip on our social media moments before kickoff. I wanted to read some of the comments from the videos that we posted on our Instagram from last week's interview with Crystal Dunn. You all clearly loved her as much as we did, and I'm so grateful for your support across all of these platforms, your comments, your likes, everything really means so much to us. Crystal spoke so openly about a bunch of really important topics, including how race impacts the way that people view athletes and how important it is to protect the women in the NWSL playing in states with limited access to reproductive health care like abortion. I'm so grateful that Crystal was willing to discuss these important issues with us, and clearly you all loved hearing from her as well. Daniela Espo on Instagram said, what a great interview. I can totally see Crystal managing a team in the future. She has that perfect combination of good energy, insight, vision, and game intelligence to do it. And Joyful Emma said, such an incredible player on the pitch and such a well-spoken leader off. So glad that she came on the women's game. Thank you all so much for these amazing and supportive comments. We hear you. We're also reading all of your emails, so keep everything coming. You can email us at womensgamemib at meninblazers.com. We're very quickly approaching the start of the NWSL season, and we're finalizing what our coverage of that is going to look like. I can definitely tell you right now that we can finally expect our favorite co-host to be back with me. Yes, we are a lot closer to having Lynn Williams back, and I couldn't be happier and more excited to work with her again. We really want to have widespread coverage here at the women's game. So our goal is to grow this network so that we have lots of different voices, lots of different views, and that we can cover all women's soccer. Lynn joining us will just be the first step in that journey, and we're starting off on the right foot. There's so much more to come, so stay tuned. I wanted to give you guys a little update on my personal life this weekend. I walked a 5K this weekend. It was so much fun. Pat and I went on, we signed up for a race, we got little bib numbers, and then we brought our coffees and we started walking. Um, I came in dead last. I looked up my time on the race website and I came in dead last, which I thought was like 
so funny. Um, but it was so much fun. I think like a part of me for a while has been sad that running and doing a lot of impact activity really like isn't in the cards for me that much. Um, but being able to go and do like a community event and just walk and still get outside and get some exercise, it was really cold, but it was a lot of fun and I'm really glad that I got to do it. Today, we are so lucky to have Jill Scott on the show. Jill is hilarious and my time at Man City was so much better because she was there. It was so much more fun and she was so welcoming. You're going to hear all about this. I have so much respect for Jill and what she's done in the wake of retiring from soccer and she had so many amazing stories for us. You're about to hear them all. Despite some technical difficulties and a location switch on her end, this conversation was so much fun. So enjoy this interview with Jill Scott. Okay, today on the podcast, we have an absolute legend, former Lionesses midfielder, Jill Scott. Jill is truly one of the most legendary footballers to have played the game. She played in the Women's Super League in England for Everton and Man City and starred for the Lionesses for 161 international caps. Jill also won the 2022 Euros, the 2016 WSL, and she's a three-time Women's FA Cup winner. One of those was with me at Man City. Since retiring from the game after England's historic 2022 Euros win, Jill's influence and personality has shown through beyond the pitch. She won Britain's reality TV show, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, and has been absolutely launched into reality TV stardom ever since. Jill owns her own coffee shop in Manchester. It's called Box to Box, and she really is just one of the funniest, greatest teammates and players I had the pleasure of playing with. We were probably the tallest pair of midfielders ever to take the pitch together when we played for Man City. I would love if somebody could confirm that statistic. And I probably said, sorry, what to her the most times out of all my teammates in Manchester, but it was always worth having her repeat the joke. Jill, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. And so nice to see you, Sam, as well. It's It's been quite a while, I feel. I know. It is so nice to see you. So... Like I just said, when I first got to Man City in 2020, I struggled with this language barrier that I didn't even know existed. What do you remember about Rose, Lavelle, and I showing up to Manchester? Was Were we what you expected Americans to be like? <laughs> yeah, I think I just remember you being um, very chilled, um, obviously taken to the field. You were very, very good footballers. I think you said in that bio that we were the two tallest people to share the pitch. But I've got to be honest, we didn't share the pitch that many times because I think you took your shirt, took my shirt off me. So and rightfully so, I must say rightfully so. But no, it was just great to have you. As I remember, obviously Manchester City, fantastic club, but we were ready to try and take the club to that next level. And I think having you and Boz really did do that. So yeah, just fun happy memories really and lots of coffees after training as well so you've been retired from soccer now for about 18 months and you've used that time to establish yourself as one of the most respected football pundits in both men's and women's football in the UK what have you found is the key to good broadcasting and how do you think you found success so immediately oh I feel a bit bad about the punditry because I actually don't do too many games so I think in England obviously you had Alex Scott, Karen Carney, Farrah Williams they were the ones that kind of set the bar high for punditry Um, yeah I've been able to do a few games but I think kind of the key is just to be honest really I think if you mess up which we all do I think just to own it um, and yeah just have fun with it I think when you finish playing the closest thing is actually the punditry um, rather than playing so I've just been kind of really grateful to have the opportunity to do that. Totally um, so I'm just now embarking on my first year being officially retired from playing and when we were texting to set up this interview, you gave me some advice. You said, stay away from Twitter, be you, and listen to the people that matter, which I thought was such great advice. Um, do you remember the best advice you yourself have gotten since you've retired? Yeah, so probably the best advice was probably that advice, and I'm passing it on to you. So, yeah, I think um, the thing is with Twitter, especially when we speak about the punditry and stuff like that, you you do get compliments on there, but it's kind of like when you played, like that one negative comment mm -hmm. always sticks in your mind. So I have used social media platforms and I think there's a lot of good that come from them when I was doing my soccer camps and stuff like that. But I think you also have to learn how to use it as well. Like 
because sometimes it can get you down and make mm-hmm. you feel down about yourself. So, yeah, I think listening to the people that matter, that probably stems from my playing days. I kind of obviously you appreciate the fans and stuff like that, but I never looked to them for validation of my performance. It was always teammates and coaches. And, yeah, I think really if you live in the reality of your world, if you get a negative stuff on Twitter, if you're walking around in your own world, you don't really hear that noise. So mm-hmm. it was a good bit of advice that I got. Well, I think that's such great advice and I'm really taking it to heart. I agree that if you're gonna let all the good stuff from strangers online, like fuel you, then of course the bad stuff is going to sink in and really affect you as well. So I think as a player, I've kind of had like this distance from social media comments and um, just the whole commentary that's going on on there because you almost have to protect yourself and just listen to your core group. So I love that you passed that on to me. Thank you so much. Um, (laughs) I want to go all the way back to the beginning of your career and life, your childhood. You grew up in Sunderland, a town that's crazy for football way up in Northeast England gives its name to the trauma filled show Sunderland till I die. And you were playing soccer with boys. And I heard this story about how the parents of the boys on the other teams used to like yell out nasty things like break that girl's legs and your coach would have to sub you off to protect you. Can you take us back to that time and like talk about what that was like and how that made you feel as just a young kid? I remember coming off the pitch in tears a lot of the time, but I didn't really understand it when I was a child because to me I was just doing what I love doing. But yeah, the boys were kind of... The boys were really nice to us. I think they could tell that I could play a little bit. And I think when you're kids, you're very open-minded as well. So they kind of wanted me to be on their team. But yeah, it did hurt. It definitely reduced us to tears. And obviously my parents weren't always at the football matches because going back to them days, even though I'm talking like it's about 80 years ago, but it was kind of you didn't have four cars to a household. You had siblings You had who had to be places as well. But um. Yeah, I think I realised from a very early age when we speak about resilience and determination, sometimes you can just throw these words around and say, we need to be determined, we need to be resilient. But I think that resilience was building in me from such a young age because even now, when you fast forward, to sometimes getting comments say about punditry and broadcasting Mm -hmm. and saying, oh, women can't do that. It's kind of like I've been told females can't do stuff since the age of eight or nine, so... I do kind of say that maybe it's it's sad in a way that you had to accept that at such a young age, but it kind of set us up for the world and, and how it is now sometimes. Definitely. Um, when you signed your first professional contract, you were 17. It was for Sunderland and in 2004. Yeah. You, you must have experienced more of this. I mean, you were playing, what was playing professionally like for a female footballer in England? When I think about your, you're talking about resilience and determination. I imagine that you went through a lot in that time, kind of paving the way for young female players. And was it totally different to how it is now? Would the young players who play today believe the kind of situations that you were in? Yeah, it's completely different. And I, I tried not to be that player that was like, back in our day, we had to drive 170 miles to training and back and get back two o'clock in the morning because it's hard because for the next generation, that wasn't their journey. And I think sometimes it's nice to share, but also at the same time, like kind of not like tell the story all the time because I think they're living in a completely different generation. But I kind of say that I don't feel like I turned fully professional till I was about 26 and signed for Manchester City. It went from training on nights to training on days and training every single day and football. I always kind of describe it as football kind of had to fit into my life in them years. But then when I signed for Manchester City, it was like, how is life going to fit into football? So, yeah, I've got some great memories, great memories. Um, I think I speak quite a lot of, I was working up in Sunderland uh, when I signed for Everton. I was 18 years old. I had to travel three times a week, um, three hours one way, three hours back, and then work during the day. So we used to get that last uh, training slot, which was 8 till 10 p.m. on the night after all the boys' football, everything. But you know what? I loved it because I didn't know any difference. So it wasn't like I was rocking up going, oh, I wish we could train at nine o'clock in the morning because I didn't know any different. But I remember when I was at Manchester City, I was thinking, God, how did I train 
at that time at night because I was suddenly in bed at nine, ten o'clock. So, yeah, it changed a lot. But you know what? I wouldn't change any part of my journey because I met the most amazing people throughout it. Yeah. Uh, you got your first cap for the Lionesses in 2006 playing against the Netherlands. Um, and as somebody who grew up surrounded by football all the time, you must have had some heroes who were on that team. What was it? Who were some of those heroes? And what was it like getting to play on the same team as them for the first time? Oh, you know what? They're my friends now and I still see them as heroes. <laughs> so like Kelly Smith, Rachel Yankee, Farrah Williams, Cameron Carney, like some of my closest friends. And you know what? I always describe that day as... I felt like, you know, when you can put yourself in the FIFA game as a player, that's what I felt yeah. like. I was like, oh, my God, I've just, like, entered this game. And I was so nervous, so scared. I think I ran through one-on-one -on -one with the keeper and put the ball wide. And, yeah, I just was like, I think I just had so many pinch-me moments where I was like, as if you're playing with these games. And I think upon reflection on my career, I definitely had imposter syndrome. And um, mm. probably never thought I had the football and standard to play at the level I was playing, which is crazy because I'd, I played 161 times for England. But I think what helped us with that is I knew I had a big engine. I knew I would work hard and I kind of just hung my hat on them things. But I think if I'd gone into games and thought, you know what, I'm going to beat you by going past you or scoring a top corner goal, I knew I wasn't going to do them things. So, yeah, I think upon reflection, I definitely had a bit of imposter syndrome. And people always say it was, oh, that's a bit sad. But I wonder if I'd have gone on to have had the career that I had if I didn't have that, because I think it kind of kept us fueled and, and grounded, really. Uh, for sure. A lot of what you said re really resonates with me. I remember when I was young on the U.S. Women's National Team, Jill Ellis was the head coach at the time. And she said something to me one time off the cuff, like, we really like you because you pass the ball with pace. So then I started going, I have to pass the ball with pace every single pass. And I started nailing all my passes at all of my teammates all the time. And I was young on the team playing with a lot of my own heroes. And I remember Carly Lloyd had to pull me aside and go, I know Jill told you to pass the ball hard, but there's a time and a place where you have to kind of lay it off sometimes. Um, <laughs> and it was just, there was such a learning curve from being a young player playing with women that you'd idolized forever to coming into your own. And I kind of agree that I, I wish I had more time to come into my own and to play with confidence as if I knew I belonged there. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I must like say Sam, I know that you'll you'll hate this because I know you hate probably a lot of good comments and stuff like that. But I obviously played for a lot of years for England. And I remember when you came to Manchester City and I was like, wow, you were another level. Obviously, I played against you, um, America and, and stuff like that. But I think you definitely took that midfield role to another level and was so consistent with it. To come into Manchester City, which a top club in England, usually it takes time to adjust and stuff like that. And I know you'll probably say you got on great with the girls, which which probably helped you. But honestly, I'd, I've never seen someone play that eight and ten position, how, how you played it. So I just wanted to say that because I think sometimes when you're at the club, we were fighting for each other's spot. and <laughs> um, But I, hands down, was like, you deserve that spot. But I just thought, yeah, I just think what, what a great player. And that is total credit to you. And I think you've really set the standard now for the players that come into that position because it's like, that's how you play it. So I did want to say that. Well, I really appreciate that, Jill. That is That really means a lot to me coming from you. I remember fighting for that spot and having to chase you around and being like, this girl never gets tired in training. <laughs> so I really loved playing with you and I have so much respect for you as a player. You've played in 10 international world tournaments for England. And just for context, I've only played in two. You played in four <laughs> World Cups, two Olympics for Team GB and four Euros. I feel like that record of like being available all the time signals that you must have stayed really healthy throughout your career do you remember yeah. a major injury or what do you credit staying healthy to I almost feel bad for saying this because obviously I know a lot of players have had injuries yourself including but I, I didn't really have an injury and I, I almost feel bad for saying that like I think I missed in 16 years one international um camp 
Wow. So I was I was very, very lucky. I will say that I was very lucky. And when I look back, at the, well, it's not funny, but yesterday I actually rolled my ankle walking across the room. I think I'm I was so going to sorry. make sorry. I was going to make a cup of tea, but I was like, I, but I think what I said was because I don't have any ligaments in my ankle. So I must have injured it when I was playing when I was younger. But it was back in the day when you probably didn't get surgery and, and stuff like that. So I'm sure I will definitely suffer for it in, in years to come. But I think obviously there's loads of injuries that can happen that are freak injuries and stuff like that. And that's why I say I was very lucky. Um, I think one thing, keeping fit and healthy, I, I must say I'm a very good sleeper. So like, and I do think that probably did help me a lot in my playing career. So I always had like 10 hours sleep. I never had broken sleep. I could get in from training. I could just, I could just nap anywhere, a little bit like a dog, really. So I know wow. that the, the best form of recovery is sleep. And that's why I used to get so mad, you know, when you used to get in at 11, 12 o'clock at night after an away game. And they get you in early for recovery. And I'm like, sleep is the best form of recovery. I know. So, yeah, I do wow. think that was, it, it was a good it was a, a, a good kind of habit, I suppose, in a way. I'm impressed that you say you can sleep anywhere because you're so tall. I'm tall <laughs> and I feel like I can never nap because I never have enough space. <laughs> that is a good point. But I don't know why my mom said when I was younger, I'd just be running around all over and she'd just find us asleep, like on the kitchen floor or something. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I can definitely wow. see. Uh, okay, so moving on. In in 2019, we played each other in the World Cup semifinal, England versus USA. It, that game was one of the hardest, most intense games that I recall ever playing in. I just subbed in at the end, but it was so close and so competitive and seriously right down to the last minute. What are your memories from that game? Well, I remember um, who played midfield that game because had you played the games leading up to that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and then, then Lindsay started. Uh, Lindsay Horan started that game. Yeah. So what I remember from that game is the first ten minutes of that game, and I'm not saying it was intentional. She's just a very physical player, but she caught us about three times with our arms. And I remember running up to Nikita Paris going, "You're gonna have to push my like eye back in because it was all swelling and I couldn't really see." So that's what I remember from the first ten minutes. Um. And I just remember she was kind of, I was marking her directly. And I think you and her had similar like physical profile. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember like I'd make a run, but she wouldn't really stay with us. And she kind of half cheat and I could never get back to mark her. So it was a very <laughs> physical game. You, you played very well. We were very aware. Like, I don't know if it was a plan of yours, but you always started games like a hundred mile an hour. So we were like, we need to just kind of kind of shut them up for this period, try not to concede and then take the game to them. But I think we'd already conceded. But it was a great game. I think there was a penalty right at the end. And yeah, so we were so close. But I think that's just international tournaments, isn't it? I know. It's like a game of inches. Um, do you remember when Alex Morgan scored, she did the tea drinking celebration? <laughs> Were, yeah. Did you guys see that happen in real time? Was it discussed after the fact? I don't No, I don't think so. I think I'm very, even though this is going to go against us for the um, Euros final when I started swearing and got caught on camera, <laughs> but I was going to say I'm not very emotional when I play in terms of like, I think I can stay quite logical. Mm -hmm. um, obviously I shout a lot and whatever else, but I think something like that wouldn't annoy us because I just think they've scored. We need to get the ball and we need mm -hmm. to, like, I wouldn't be like, oh my God, she's just done that celebration because <laughs> I think I learned throughout my career you can carry a lot of unwanted energy. Um, and still, even to this day, I, I don't even know, yeah, okay, the English like to drink cups of tea. I've got a coffee shop. Um, so it's true. We do like tea and coffee. Yeah. Like, there's probably a lot more things that you could have done. That would a have lot, been a lot more insulting options yeah. for sure. Exactly. Um, okay. So we're going to get to the euros. The highlight of your career came in the summer of 2022 at the euros. Your England team went on such a magical run. 
when you think about where you started your England career, it was probably like on a muddy pitch in front of not that many people to where you ended it, winning the Euros in front of nearly 90,000 people in a sold out Wembley Stadium, bringing home England's first trophy since 1966 for men or women. Can you take us inside the final moment, the whistle blows, how you felt to have your journey culminate in that way? No, honestly, I still get the, like goosebumps now when anybody ever speaks about it. I know I've used the word grateful a lot, but I know there's so many people in sport that don't get the, the perfect ending. So that is why, firstly, I'm so grateful. And you know what? That final whistle went and... I know how much you respect Kira Walsh as a, a player, a person, but she was incredible that tournament. And honestly, for me, I think she's one of the best midfielders in the world. I know you'll appreciate that as well. Whenever I felt like I had a good game, it was because she was playing as these passes that nobody else could see. And I just ran over to her. I think I picked her up and was like, just thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. Because... I hadn't like played too much. Um, I was coming on for like the last 10 minutes or something. And then I ended up playing about 35 minutes of that game because of extra time. So it was just so kind of, yeah, it was just such a, a great moment for me. And I know that Serena had kind of, this is why Serena is such a good manager because I knew I wasn't going to play much, but she instilled us with so much confidence and belief that she trusted us to go on to the pitch um, and I think, yeah, that, that final moment, I just, if I could bottle it up and just carry it around forever, which I kind of do in a bit of a dodgy tattoo on my arm, if I can <laughs> show you that, probably not. Um, I've got a, got a tattoo with the date on and stuff like that. And I catch a glimpse of it and it just makes a smile because it was just such a, a great day. Oh, I, I mean, you can tell how much it means to you by the way you talk about it to an American audience. Can you talk a little bit about just the importance of the Euros as a tournament and why winning at this moment in time was so monumental for women's football in England? Yeah, well, I think obviously USA, I was playing against USA in the World Cup 2007. Um, and obviously you was such a, you just won all the time. Like I was kind of like fascinated with how you used to just pull out these victories in the last minute. And it was never down to luck or anything like that. It was like a mentality. And I could see how much it had done for the game in the US. Um, a lot of people used to say it's bigger than men's football. And we had players, this is probably like 2010, 11, maybe later, going out to USA to play football because of the, the magnitude of it. And I even remember being like a really about 11, 12, and we used to play in tournaments and a team used to come over from the USA and they'd have the rucksack and they'd have the ball attached to the bag. And I was just like, wow, like football, soccer out there is is incredible. And I always felt like in England we were a bit behind that. And I know this sounds like really obvious to say, but I don't think I realised how much success could help with that. Like we mm. were always striving to get like respect on the women's game. Uh, get girls opportunities and I think we just unlocked it it was like we unlocked this new level of a computer game by getting that success so yeah I think straight after the tournament we realized that a lot of girls I think it was like over 50 percent didn't even get the opportunity to play football in school so I wasn't even aware of this I always just thought oh girls football's getting bigger women's football's getting bigger but yeah, I felt like the Euros really took it to that next level. And just even when you speak about your day-to-day -day life, so many more people, bearing in mind I played for England for 15 years before the Euros, so many more people in that last year saying, oh, my daughter plays football and dad's coming up to us saying, oh, I have to take my daughter on a Saturday, my son on a Sunday. And yeah, it just really has, I would probably use the phrase, unlocked a a new level of girls and women's football in England. Yeah, that makes total sense. And like you were just saying, after you won the Euros, there were a number of things that your team fought for in the aftermath. Your, you and your teammates wrote a letter to the government three days after the tournament demanding equal access to sports for girls. And the government responded by committing $760 million to the cause. And in addition to that, the government Premier League and FA announced that they would honor your victory by naming 23 grassroots facilities after the 23 players in the Lionesses squad. 
yours opened in Jarrow, just five miles from Sunderland where you grew up. What did that feel like to see the Jill Scott pitch open up so close to your hometown? Oh, that was such a good day. It was a very cold day. I remember that. The Northeast <laughs> is very cold. But I remember, um, you'll know yourself, even though you're a lot more prepared than me, like reading briefs last minute. And I was like, I remember the day before, I was like, oh, this is actually the football pitch that we're all getting after the Euros. And I thought, that's quite quick. And I thought I was going to just rock up and it was going to be like a, I don't know, a five-a-side pitch or whatever. And oh my God, this facility was like two 11-a-side pitches, like together, 4G, wow. changing rooms. And it was the fact that like the, the said girls and women's football would get priority on this pitch. And don't get us wrong, I am a massive fan of boys' football, men's football. But it really took us back to them moments where I was a young girl waiting until 8 p.m., in Liverpool to get a two-hour training session, getting back home at two o'clock in the morning. And it just made us think, you know what, maybe the next young girl, the next young adult, I'll get that earlier training slot. And it was really like a, a full circle moment. And then to reveal it, I think it said the Jill Scott pitch. And yeah, it was a, a very, very special moment. I like just got chills hearing that. I think full circle <laughs> moments like that are so cool and they really make you take stock of your whole journey as a footballer and when especially when it brings you back home and you kind of get to give something back to the community that helped you get where you are I just yeah. think that that's like the most special thing um okay this is my last euros question and I have to ask <laughs> I think you know what it's gonna be yeah. you came on in the 88th minute and shortly after the cameras picked you up in slow motion saying to German midfielder Sidney Lohman excuse me young listeners F off, you effing prick. First of all, <laughs> Bill, when did you realize that that moment went viral? Oh, I think, you know what? I don't even think I realized till probably a couple of hours after because I didn't want to be on my phone, you know, yeah. after I wanted to take it all in the celebrations. And yeah, and then I think people kept sending us this gift. But it's funny how things happen because I think that's like a real moment where, if we hadn't have won that game, I think that would have been seen as a negative thing. So it would have been mm. like, you're meant to be a role model. Look at the language. and mm. But then because we won the game, it was like, look at the passion. And yeah, I wasn't, I really wasn't proud of it. I don't even like swearing. Like, honestly, if you ask anybody in day to day life, I'm not somebody that swears. And I'll always like pick people up on, you shouldn't say that and, and stuff. So it was quite ironic that, I don't even know what made us say that. I was just so rallied up for these. It was almost like my whole life depended on these 30 minutes of football. So, and you can't see on the footage, but I am telling the truth. Like she had like hold of my leg in between like her legs and I couldn't get up. And then I just got up and said that. But the funny thing was that um, Georgia Stanway then went on to sign um, for a German club and she was playing with her. <laughs> so they sent us a video message for my retirement and it was like her saying, happy retirement now, F off your yeah, F. <laughs> but it was really <laughs> funny. I was like, it was probably the best retirement video I got, actually. That is so funny. <laughs> and you also got a tattoo commemorating the moment, spelling out yeah. F-O-Y-F-P. Yeah. When did you get decide to get the tattoo? Well, I was doing a TV programme, which is all about sport and comedy here in England. And we were going through a bit of uh, the script stuff. And they said they were getting Mary Earps on the show. They were going to ask her about, because she did some swearing in the World Cup. And they were like, oh, you should say to her, who's swearing's better or something like that. So in the moment, I was like, why don't I go and get the tattoo and I'll show her it on the show? And do you know what the mad thing is? <laughs> It never even made the TV show. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I got this tattoo and I was like ready for the reveal. I did it on the show, but they cut the show down and it didn't even make it. So oh. yeah, never mind. It's memories. Oh. It's memories. It, it, those are, those are good memories. That is really, really funny. Um, So you and Ellen White, longtime England striker were, you retired after your Euros win. Did you know that that would be the last time that you'd wear the England shirt and Obviously, going out on top is amazing, but was there a sadness there too to be done? Um, you know what? There, there wasn't a sadness because of that ending. I think 
I'd I'd known for a while, like obviously, um, I think the season we were at Manchester City, I went out on loan. I think mm-hmm. that was the first year I went out on loan. So I was kind of like, I probably didn't enjoy my last couple of years as much in club football. I, I like going on the loan moves. I met, met some incredible people, but it's a real, when you're like 34, 35, going to a new club, you've only got four months to make an impression. There's kind of quite a big expectation on your shoulders. It was a real push for me them last two years just to kind of keep going, keep the level. Um, and then I, I tried with like all my might really to get to that Uvos squad. So I think I knew that was kind of all the en- energy I had left the the game you played with Lauren Hemp, I was like, I can't chase this girl anymore. I was like, she's, she's so much quicker than me. But I think I could just see the level of the game kind of going up again. And I thought, I think I would have, I know people say, oh, you'd have been okay for another season. But I think I knew that the level was getting away from me. So, yeah, I think in the back of my mind, I knew. Um, but you know what I did? I've spoke about this before, but I, I put that gold medal on at Wembley. And I did one last box to box run, and I was oh. like, Wait, "That's it." I was like, "Best moment ever done." Oh my gosh, that's really really cool. Well, um, just a year later in 2023, you watched England in the World Cup. It was your first time watching that team in a long time. Um, what were your emotions like watching them make it all the way to the final and then having to watch them lose? Yeah, it was it was hard being on the side. Actually, I was doing a bit of punditry and I'd kind of come in at half time and full time. Yeah. And obviously watching the game, the games that I wasn't doing the punditry compared to when I was, the games that I wasn't, I just got so like with the emotions. I was like, yeah. just go for it. You're not working. And yeah, I'd, I'm sure you can probably um, agree with this. That it's so much harder watching from the sides so much harder I was saying to the families I was like I could feel that anxiety and like from all the families I was sitting with and I was like you do know the girls are fine like you go on that pitch and you just do what you've always done but I could really feel the emotions but have you found it hard like from the side yeah I have I think I'm very hopeful that now that I have kind of officially stepped away, I was hopeful that it would get easier. I think watching from with the perspective that I was not there because I was injured was really hard because I felt this sense of loss for myself. Like, Oh, I should be there. And I, I could be there. Um, I found it hard when there was a lot of negative criticism about the team as well, because they're my best friends. My sister was on the team. And I, I almost would get so emotional and angry that anybody could ever doubt them because I just love them all so much. But then it was also kind of my job to give this commentary. So it's been challenging in a lot of different ways. And I'm hopeful that now that I'm on the outside a little bit more, that will change, but it sounds like it might not. (laughs) (laughs) I think you can certainly, you you can enjoy it, but it's really hard, isn't it? When you attach to them players, I think, it almost needs that generation to kind of pass mm. through that for your teammates. And then I'm not saying, I think you'll then have, obviously you'll still follow the team and everything, but it'll be like a different type of love. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, it, it's difficult, but I'm sure you're the same as me. I, I always say it. I'm, I'm the biggest fan of them all and I still text them and I, I still get them feelings like, or oh, so-and-so didn't play this weekend and then mm-hmm. she's going on international camp. So I'll check in and it's really hard to just detach from it sometimes fully. Yeah, for sure. I know. I, I feel the same way with so many of my close friends still there that you, you get, you have those feelings for them all the time and you want to check in, which I'm sure coming from you, it means so much to have you checking in on them. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the last soccer question. Okay. Um, so the lioness is, as we've discussed you and your team, you've had such an enormous impact on female athletes in England, pushing the game forward and advocating for the next generation is really part of the job. Emma Hayes, who's the current Chelsea manager and is set to be the U S women's national team manager has played a really important role in changing the landscape of football for female players in England as well. We keep hearing such great things about her here in the U S everybody that knows her is raving about her as a coach and as a person. And I know you haven't played directly for her, but I'm assuming that you've crossed paths and I'm wondering if you have anything you can share about Emma Hayes 
that will give U.S. Women's National Team fans a sense of her personality. Yeah, I think Emma's been absolutely fantastic for football in England. You've you've seen our success um, rate. I think what Emma is so good at is building teams. So it's almost like she can work out exactly what they need. Do they need a bit of experience? Is it time to kind of uh, inject a little bit of young blood? And I think she's really good at working out the balance and dynamics of a team. Um, she kind of seems to build this success no matter what happens. I think she's very adaptable. I've seen her teams have major injuries, but then she still works out a way of solving the problem. And I think that is such a big thing. Obviously, it's a bit of a funny one. Mine and Emma's paths have crossed a lot more since I retired. But when I played for Manchester City, she was obviously the Chelsea coach. So the rivalry was so intense because... I wanted our team to win so much. She wanted her team to win so much. So I think kind of when you're on the other team, it'd be like because of the success she was getting, be like, I don't like this. And yeah, but I think when you're her player, I know all the girls, I'm really good friends with them, Karen Carney. And I know how much she loved playing for Emma. And I've never heard a bad word be said about her really. And even the stuff she stands for outside of football, I hear her doing interviews like this mm-hmm. and she never shies away from a tough topic. Uh, she'll always stand up for the game, stand up for our team. And yeah, I, I wish her all the best. I, I think she'll do a fantastic job. I know all the Chelsea girls are absolutely gutted that she's leaving. And for everybody to be gutted kind of shows the, the footprint that you've left on a team because usually you get some players, you know, when... When you're not playing and stuff like that, the manager changes and you're like, oh, I'm glad the manager's going. But all them girls, she seems to always get a performance out of them, mm-hmm. whether they're playing, not playing. Um, and yeah, I can't speak highly enough of her. And, and I haven't played for her, so I think you're in for a real treat. Wow. Well, that's another rave review for Emma Hayes. We're very excited (laughs) about this. Okay, Jill, you have had such an amazing career on the field, off the field, in the referee's little book where they record all the fouls. You have left such an incredible legacy, but we left some things out. Most importantly, I couldn't wait to ask you about this. You slide tackled Prince William in 2012 in a charity match, and he said that he still has a scar. Can you please tell the whole story? (laughs) Yeah, I met Prince William. I think it was just after my England debut. Um, so it might have been a little bit earlier than that. But basically, we were opening this football pitch and they said, oh, can we just do a little five-a-side game? And I actually, I had trainers on. He had the ball. I slipped and, like, whacked into him. And then the England team, before we would go to a tournament, he'd always pay us a visit. And every time he'd see us, he'd be like, I'm watching you because he knew that I slide tackled him but you know what our paths have crossed a few times and we always have good conversations I remember 2015 World Cup in Canada Um, he dialed into a kind of like a zoom call just to like wish us all luck and he was like Jill I hope you're not getting any yellow cards out there so yeah he was um, yeah he's a great guy great guy he always follows the football in England um, and you kind of chat to him and you forget that you're speaking to the future king. Like I talked to him probably how I would speak to my brother. So great guy, great guy. Wow. Okay. Thank you for telling us about that. Um, You opened a coffee shop in Manchester in 2021 with your partner, Shelly. Why the coffee shop? And what's your favorite coffee order from your own place? You came to the coffee shop, didn't you? I did. I loved it. We do have you on a a picture at the shop. So we have like all the famous people that came to the shop. We have like a little canvas of you all. So, yeah, I think you were there with Rose. And wasn't there some more of your USA teammates? I'm sure there was. I'm going to find the picture and send you it. I'm sure there was. Yeah, please do. Um, I. Oh, yeah. Abby Joel Kemper was there. Yeah, she yeah, was yeah, there. Yeah. I think a couple of the Man City players as well. But yep. yeah, it's I can't take any credit. Shelley does a lot of the work. She always says, I just go in and drink and eat the profit. So yeah, <laughs> but extra hot flat white is always my order Ooh. with a tiny bit of brown sugar, tiny bit. Oh my gosh, I need one of those right now. <laughs> um, okay, so we also know that you were a big runner as a kid. And you won the junior Great North Run. Do you still run now or play any other sports? 
<laughs> so yeah, it was. Um, I don't. Well, I've just been for a run now, and it was quite embarrassing. I tried to do a five k, and I'm like three minutes slower than when I played, which is embarrassing. Um, but what do I do any sports now? I kind of. If you played paddle before, is that like pickleball? Uh, yeah, a kind of. Like that. Yeah, yeah, I love playing that. Um, but I need to, you know what? I, I've hardly done any exercise. It, it's not good. And I keep using excuses. You can probably hear you. I've got a little bit of a cold at the minute. And yeah, I, used to be when I, yeah, I used to be when I played like chest infection, cold. It's not going to beat me. I'm going to play. And now I'm like, oh, I've got a bit of a cold. I'll, I, I won't do my run today. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel you on that. Um, Can you describe your favorite goal you've ever scored oh but I should remember this because I haven't scored that many but I think it was the FA Cup final at Wembley we we did win 4-1 and it was the last goal but I actually scored quite a good goal did a little dummy and the defender went to ground and I think it was just it was at Wembley we won the FA Cup with Manchester City and my family were in the crowd so yeah I did like that goal Oh, amazing. Um, can you name the best player you've ever played with? Oh, it's a very difficult question. If I speak about the last six, seven years, I have to say Kira. I, I honestly do. I think the things that she used to do in training, we used to sometimes stop and just give her a clap. I remember in the Euros, training stopped and everyone just clapped her because I just think, I'm sure you would agree, the things that that girl can do with a football, yeah. I totally agree. We're talking about Kira Walsh, mm-hmm. who we played with at Man City together, and Jill obviously played with Kira for England. And I yeah. remember coming to Man City and seeing Kira play and being like, oh my God, this is the best midfielder I've ever seen. And I think the Euros is when everybody in the world realized, oh my God, Kira is the best. Like, she's so good. So I've been, yeah. it's been so fun watching her journey and feeling like I got like a little sneak peek earlier on that I knew she was going to be so good. It's been really, really fun to watch. Okay. Yeah. Very last question, Jill. We know that you love poetry. Oh, poetry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to either tell us a little bit about your poetry or if you have a poem handy or memorized, you Ooh. could share yeah, so I do, um, I'm hoping actually, this is probably, I've never probably said this before, but I'm hoping to try and do a bit of a poetry book this year. So I've been writing quite a few different poems, but it's kind of, it's I've used it as a little bit of like um, just emptying my thoughts and, and my head really, you know, after like a busy period, obviously a lot happened to us when I retired and I used a bit of time just to kind of reflect on life and and write some poems. I might have one. Let's have a look. I'm going to have a look in my notes because okay. uh, let's have a look. I do. I did write one about a mobile phone. Uh, I won't read it all out, but <clears throat> this was the first one I ever wrote on paper. So this is 2019. So nobody's heard this yet, but um, I'll read the first bit. So. Nowadays, how much time do we get alone? Our plus one is always a mobile phone. Invented to enable us to be able to ring, probably the least operation we use on the thing. Searching to share our every move, wealth, happiness, dying to prove. To people we don't even know, their comments can make us feel so low. How many likes can define our day, our mood, more concerned with strangers than our own brood? Questions you hear... How many followers have you got? Bloody thousands, but true friends, not a lot. So that goes on and on. It's quite a long poem, but yeah, I like poetry. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was like amazing. <laughs> so oh yeah, my gosh. maybe if I do get to bring a, a book out, I'll send you a copy. Oh my gosh. I'd please autograph it for me. Um, <laughs> Jill, you were honestly one of the very first people to make me feel welcome at Man City. I was in a new country where I thought I spoke the language, but it turns out I only understood half of it. I had decided to come to Manchester during the pandemic and walked into a team full of people that I didn't really know. Like we've talked about, you and I played the same position, which always leads to competition for the spot. And you still made me feel welcome and valued, which I think speaks so much to your character. 
you are a natural leader. You led by example. You worked hard every single day. And I seriously would dread having to chase after you in training because you actually <laughs> never got tired. Um, I'm so grateful that you came on the show and thank you so much for being here. We like really appreciate it and we love you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I just want to wish you all the best with your retirement. I know you're going to smash it because you're a great player and a great person. So yeah, thank you for having me. That was Jill Scott, everybody. I was so happy to get a chance to catch up with her and her sharing that poem with us at the end. What a woman of endless talents. Honestly, my favorite thing about this podcast so far is that I've had the opportunity to catch up with old friends and like have real conversations with them. It really reminds me that I should just be calling people more, but this is a, this is good enough for now. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Women's Game MIB. Subscribe to our newsletter by going to the link tree in our bios. Thank you all so much for being here. This was honestly such an incredible episode. I'm so grateful for you all. I'm Sam Mewis, and this is the Women's Game. See you soon.